Hi there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. Today, I'm gonna talk about using lower price materials to get good results because, hey, we don't always have um, a ton of money to spend on our art supplies, or maybe we're just a little nervous using the really expensive stuff. So I'm gonna show you how to create some really beautiful results using some inexpensive watercolors. These are by Joy Art, and my first tip for you is to squirt a little drop onto a plate or a palette and work from the fresh paint. Now, even if these dry up and you do wanna reuse the rest of them, you totally totally can. And I find that with student grade paints, sometimes if I fill an entire well in my palette with them, they'll crack and fall out unless I add honey or glycerin to them. If I work with them straight from the tube like I did here, even if I still have some left in my palette and it dries, when it's a small amount like that, it doesn't seem to crack and fall out and mix up with my other colors. So just take out a little bit at a time. And working with it fresh from the tube like I am here, you can see the color is rich, vibrant, and blends together, much like a more expensive watercolor would. The next tip I have for you is to practice your stroke work and brush strokes. So these uh, simple little leaves here are done by uh, just pressing and lifting my brush. And then I can drip in other colors if I want to adjust their, um, their tone or value. By playing with your brush and seeing what your brush can do, you're able to build a lot of really great experience and you can do that without having really expensive supplies. Speaking of brushes, I recommend investing in a good brush right off the bat because it'll last you a lifetime. Watercolor is such a gentle medium that you shouldn't be destroying your brushes with normal use. The best supplies for you to use are the ones you already have. I will link up the products that I used below in the video description, and I'll also put my list of tips for working with economy supplies there as well so you can refer to them as needed. Now, when you're working with a less expensive paper, sometimes it can tend to pill and, um, and get kind of rough if you add a lot of layers of water. So um, the thing is though, you can find decent paper for a lower price. Now this is some that I use a lot for practice pieces. It's Aqua B and I can sketch on it like this, like I am here with just a regular old mechanical pencil and I can erase and it's not going to pill. You do wanna make sure you're using a very gentle eraser, especially with um, a lot of lower quality papers because they're not as resilient as, um, as your more expensive papers. Another thing you can do is sketch on a scrap of paper and then use a light box or a bright window to transfer your design so you don't have to worry about erasing it all on your paper. But um, shop around because there is a big difference in quality for the same price. You could be paying you know, $10 for a pad of great paper or really awful paper. Um, it really helps to kind of ask around and see what other people are using. So one thing that I like to do is um, I like to paint in a light wash. Now I'm working on dry paper because I find that sometimes when you're working with less expensive paper, working with wet paint on dry paper works a little better. And also when you're working with student grade paints, um, it doesn't dilute your colors out quite so much. So they stay a little bit richer. Remember the wetter your paper, the more you're gonna have a shift when it dries, especially with student grade paints. So I'm just kind of going right in on the dry paper with my brush loaded with wet paint. Even though this is an inexpensive paint, because I've just mixed up just the amount of water I need on my palette and put it on dry paper, I'm keeping a nice vibrant result. Working in this fashion can actually allow you to paint on sketchbook paper and still have good results. So um, I really want to show you some techniques that you can use no matter what sort of paper you're working on. And I'm just kind of going in and layering on some darker colors, spreading around some of the colors that I've applied and just being all over gentle with my paper. Now you can wet an area if you wanna have a subtle uh, bit of color or you want your color to flow a little bit, that shouldn't be an issue. Make sure your brushes are soft because when you're working with paper that may not be the highest quality, um, a rough brush can really damage the fibers and disturb the layer of sizing. Often your less expensive papers kind of skimp out on the sizing and they use shorter fibers of paper or cotton and then those little short fibers kind of unweave themselves and that's when the pilling happens. When you need to lighten a color, gently blot it with a paper towel to pick up some of the color. You don't want to, um, to rub it and disturb your paper. Now you can get really fine details just by using a cut up piece of credit card to scrape in some details like I did there. And then I wanna make sure that I dry my paper really well before I try to go over it with any more layers and that's gonna reduce feathering. Some of the most beautiful effects in watercolor come from layering. So here I am using a small brush loaded up with juicy red paint 
to add some details. And then I rinsed my brush and I spread the uh, color around using just water. And then I'm adding in some yellow to tone that petal. And uh, then I am just kind of dragging some of that red down to give the appearance of some veins. Now remember, you can use your credit card scraper to put in really sharp details like I did there. But when you do that on any paper, not just student paper, it's, it's marring the surface. So those veins are always gonna be there no matter how many layers of paint you put over. So make sure that's really the direction you want to go in. And just be um, aware that if you do too much scraping, you can peel the paper a little bit. So I'm going over with the second layer just to see what sort of details I can add. Now this is where you might get into some trouble with your student grade paints. Um, student grade paints are less transparent than artist grade paints because of the fillers and extenders that are needed to bring the price down so it's affordable. So you may only be able to get one or two layers on top of your initial wash before stuff starts to get kind of chalky and muddy looking. Another frustration you might have with less expensive paints is the mixing. Now, I'm a big fan of working with a limited palette and mixing, but if you saw my palette at the beginning of the video, you saw a lot of colors there. With student grade paints, you're probably gonna need to use more colors than you would with an artist grade paint because um, the student grade paints have the fillers and extenders and they're made from mixing a lot of colors and often they're made by mixing dyes and not uh, trusted pigments. So you're better to almost use the color from the tube and just tweaking it a little bit if you need to with another color you're using in the painting to make it harmonize than you are to try to mix everything. So don't be afraid if you have to have a couple extra colors on your palette to get the vibrancy that you want. One benefit to student grade paint is that it's easy to lift and manipulate because of the fillers and extenders that, they, that the paint contains. Um, you can easily lighten up and push around the paint like I did here. So what you want is a, a medium firm brush like this Maxine's mop here. And then you just simply scrub around in the area you want to move the paint and then you can push it where you want to go. Or if you want to lift it, simply blot it off. With student grade paints, you don't wanna do a lot of fiddling. You want to be fairly decisive with your brush strokes and um, you don't wanna over mix and over uh, fuss with an area or that's where the chalky and muddiness come. So here I am mixing, I did mix um, uh, Prussian blue and sap green to get this really dark green and I'm putting pretty um, bold definite strokes in. And that's what I said earlier about practicing your brush strokes. You could take notebook paper and just practice brush strokes with your less expensive paint and it will get you used to handling a brush and get you used to um, the feeling of how full you want your brush to make those brush strokes and it will just get you um, better brush control. It's kind of like practicing your penmanship in school. You would just get that muscle memory and that's what you can do with inexpensive paint just as well as you can with expensive paint. But I find that oftentimes Using your inexpensive paint makes you a little braver because you're not worried about wasting. In fact, you may be um, encouraged to do more because you want to use it up so then you can replace um, your paints with better quality. And that's another benefit to student grade paint is that you're going to learn what colors really suit you and what colors you really like. Let's say you run out of sap green before any other color. So then you go and you order a tube of artist quality sap green. Granted, that tube might cost as much as the entire set of your inexpensive student paints, but when you're replacing a tube as you need it with colors you actually use and enjoy, you're gonna make very wise purchases and you're gonna notice a big difference because you've had all that experience under your belt so that when you do upgrade to an artist gray paint, you're really gonna appreciate it and you're gonna be so far ahead of the curve because you'll know all the tricks and techniques you've needed to get by with the lower quality paint that when you have the good stuff, um, it's gonna be like skiing downhill. So far we've been working on dry paper, but I don't want you to think that you can't do washes with student grade paint. You totally can, but there is some things to keep in mind. First, keep in mind that your paint is going to be a lot lighter when it dries. So I started off by wetting one section only of my paper and then just dropping in some Prussian blue. Now I'm dropping in some lemon yellow. Since those colors are fairly close in the color wheel, I know they'll look all right. Then I added some of the um, kind of bright rose red that I used in the flower to um, just give it a little bit of pink cast. So uh, by wetting the area, you're gonna encourage the flow. Now this paint is not gonna flow as well as an artist grade paint because of the fillers and extenders that are in the um, that are in the watercolor. You also wanna make sure that you don't over mix in the background. That's why I'm wetting and adding in each pigment separately so it can do a little mixing on the paper, but I'm not dulling it on my, um, on my palette before it even hits the paper. 
If you're putting a background in after the fact like I'm doing here, you also want to be careful when you get close to the flower. Because student grade paints are more likely to lift, you don't want to um, blur your edges any more than you have to. So when I wet the paper, I don't go up to touch the flower. I just go around it and then I will just gently uh, pull the color into the picture with my brush so that I don't over wet the edges. And um, there you go. See, you can get a beautiful wet into wet wash just by applying your pigments singularly and then you can spatter in some more color if you feel like you want a looser look and here I'm using that tiny brush just to pull pigment right up to the flower without lifting the edges another frustrating thing about low quality paper is that it doesn't dry uniformly so sometimes you need to drink up some puddles so I um, just dried my brush off and laid it down in big puddles of water and also picked up puddles with my paper towel and that will just help it dry uniformly so I don't end up with those roughly cauliflower shapes in my background that's also why I wet my paper in sections because I knew if I wet the whole thing then added color some areas would dry quicker than others and I wouldn't get the flow that I wanted. Now, if you feel like your painting just isn't um, as vibrant as you want, and this happens because as you add layers of student grade paint, you can get kind of that chalky, dull finish, try mixing your media. I love to use colored pencils over my watercolors because colored pencils are translucent and they will help bring back that glow that often lower quality watercolors do not provide. By going over my leaves and petals with a bright yellow, I can help integrate them together. And then this uh, nice lime green can help brighten up some of the darker shadows without dulling them like um, too many layers of less expensive watercolor will do. I really enjoy this technique even when I'm using my expensive watercolors because I feel like it, it can add a lot of um, crispness and dimension and body to my painting that otherwise with just watercolor I might not be able to achieve. I can also get details this way so with a nice sharp green pencil I can enhance the dark uh, edges that I want to. I can put in veins, I can uh, put in folds of the petals and uh, it's a lot of fun. You'll also find that with your lesser expensive watercolors watercolors they have that little bit of a of a matte finish to them and that finish grabs colored pencils extraordinarily well so they are the perfect media to use together now I'm using Prisma colored pe color pencils which have been very inexpensive online lately but you could use any colored pencils you have to get a very similar effect you can use Crayola or Prang or you know whatever you have in your pencil box at home you don't need to spend a lot of money to get this effect I love botanical watercolors and I find that when I try to achieve them with just student grade watercolors, it falls a little short because there's only so many layers you can add and be able to get crisp detail. So with my pencils, I can reshape the edges of the overlapping petals there and get those crisp lines that I want. Because colored pencils are dry, when you go in with um, other colors to adjust previous layers, it just lays a veil over the previous layer and it doesn't muddy it up or mix in with it. And it's those glazes of color that makes expensive watercolors look so beautiful. Um, but with their student grade paints, you have two kind of strikes against you where it will, when you do your glazes, it makes, your pre makes everything muddier because you get more layers of non perfectly transparent paint, but then it can also mix in with your under layers because your layers don't fuse with the paper as much as an artist grade paint will. So um, by using colored pencils, you can achieve the look that you're after um, just by adding that extra medium. And I think that when you're creating art, you really should, um, you know, use what you got to get the effects that you're after. And there's no shame in that. And when you do upgrade to better quality supplies, you are going to have so many tricks up your sleeve that you are going to master them in no time. This video came about because I was discussing with other art teachers online um, about using lower quality materials. Now, some take the stance of, well, if you can't afford really expensive, high quality supplies, then don't even bother. And um, I'm more of the, in the camp of, of, you know use what you got you know use what you can afford there's no reason why you should let your budget dictate whether you're going to enjoy creating artwork or not if you think of what the great masters had to work with um, it's way worse than any of our student grade paints today and they still made beautiful paintings and they got joy from them so we are living in a wonderful time where you can find actually decent quality supplies at a pretty low price and 
there's just a lot out there. Don't think that you can't create art if you don't have $100 watercolors. You totally can, and hopefully these tips in this video will help you make the most of them. Thank you so much for watching. Remember, in the video description, I will have all these tips listed out and links to the supplies I used in this tutorial. Thanks for watching. Until next time, happy crafting.